Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This is going to be the third video where we're looking at the anatomy of the male reproductive system. So here we're going to look at an anterior view and we'll actually see more of the anatomy of the penis here. Uh, there's some stuff we actually have not talked about yet, but we'll also do a little bit of review of some of the important structures before we go any further. So this structure right here, this is our urinary bladder. Now this is of course going to be part of the urinary system and directly it plays no role in the reproductive system at all. But right here we have our testis. This would actually be the left testis. Here's the epididymis and we can follow the vas deferens all the way up here. And we see that it loops around into the ampulla of that vas deferens or ampulla of ductus deferens. They're the same thing. And we see here that uh, the ampulla is going to empty into the ejaculatory duct, which here is pretty small, but you can see that the seminal vesicle on the same side is going to also converge at the ejaculatory duct. And remember at this point, there's only sperm cells really running through the ampulla of the ductus deferens into the ejaculatory duct. So the first stage in semen development uh, comes from solutions made by the seminal vesicle that are emptied also into the ejaculatory duct. And those, and the ejaculatory duct then moves through the prostate. So this gland right here, this whole thing, this is the prostate gland, and this part of the urethra that runs through the prostate gland is the prostatic urethra. So the ejaculatory duct empties into the prostatic urethra. Now if we go down a little bit further, we have these muscles in here, this is the urogenital diaphragm, and again we're going to have an entire video uh, actually probably next in the playlist where we actually look at those muscles and see what they do. But the part of the urethra that runs through the urogenital diaphragm is the membranous urethra. This is the shortest segment of the urethra in males and also the middle one. And then from there, once the urethra enters the penis, we have this entire part which is either called the spongy urethra or the penile urethra. Now if we start at the proximal part of the penis, which is something that we rarely ever talk about because it's actually not visible from the surface, we actually have two important parts. We have here the bulb. The bulb is actually the central part of the base. Then we have a crus on each side, so the crus of the penis. These structures, the bulb and both of the crura, that would be the plural of crus, these are actually going to anchor the base of the penis to some bones in the pelvic area. For example, the bulb of the penis is going to anchor the penis, at least its base, to the pubic symphysis, which remember that was actually a central part of the pubic region of the pelvis. Each of the crus regions of the penis, they're going to anchor the base of the penis to uh, the ischium, the ipsilateral ischium. So um, remember that the ischium, there's one on each half of the pelvis. This one's going to anchor the penis to the uh, patient's left ischium. This is going to be the right ischium anchored over here. Right? Collectively, the bulb and the crura, plural, of the penis, these are going to be the root. And these are, again, not going to be visible because they're deeper. But the shaft or body of the penis, this is, of course, what the visible part is externally. Now, um, when we look at this, there's a few important features uh, before we actually look at the cross-section of the penis. Uh, the first part is really just the glans penis. So the glans penis is the engorged part at the very end, the distal part. Okay? If we actually take a look at a lateral view over here, um, all of this over here, this is going to be the glans penis. So it's going to be a little bit enlarged. And generally, the glans penis in at least at birth, is going to be covered by a layer of skin called the prepuce. Now the prepuce is a term that is non-sex specific, so there's actually a prepuce in both men and women. In men, the prepuce is actually the foreskin, and so it's a layer of skin that is covering normally the glans penis. Um, in a lot of societies or cultures, um, the foreskin is actually removed. That's a process called circumcision. Um, but in some cultures, it is not. But in any case, the foreskin is the male prepuce. In females, there's a layer of skin that actually covers the clitoris, and that's the female prepuce. We'll talk about that more when we cover the female reproductive system. Now, what they've done here, what this is, this is hopefully an imaginary 
cross section of the penis. So they basically just took the penis along its length and just sliced it in half. And that's a horrible image to get in your mind. But if we do this on a model like this, we can see actually some different regions of the penis that actually have some different functions. Now, up here on this cross section over here, this is actually the top of the penis. This is actually, I guess you could say superior, and down here would be inferior. So within the penis, along its entire length, there's some spongy tissue right here. There's actually three segments. The two on top, the two superior ones, are the larger ones by far. These are actually what we call the corpora cavernosa, or sometimes corpus cavernosum. Um, so if you're referring to just one of them, it would be the corpus cavernosum. So this one over here would actually be the left corpus cavernosum. But if you're talking about them collectively, it's corpora cavernosa. Right? Now, if we look below that, there's only one of these. So this one does not have a left and a right. This one is the corpus spongiosum. Okay? So there is only one of these, but there are two of these, the two corpora cavernosa. And what these tissues do inside the penis is they actually receive blood during an erection. Okay, So um, hopefully we know at this point, if you're in anatomy and physiology, that the way males get erections is by shunting blood into the penis. But the way it works is actually by filling this spongy tissue with blood. So first are the, is the corpus cavernosum, or plural corpora cavernosa. This is a pair of spongy tissue, so there's a left and right, that contain blood vessels and they expand during erection. Okay? The corpora cavernosa actually collectively receive about 90% of the blood in the penis during an erection. Okay? The other 10% is going to be in the corpus spongiosum. So the vast contribution of the increase in size during erection is due to blood flow into each of these. So it's going to be about 45% of the blood in each of these, so 90% total. Okay. Now the one on the bottom here, the inferior one, is the corpus spongiosum. The corpus spongiosum is smaller, it's still spongy tissue, and it still contains blood vessels. However, its function generally differs from that of the corpora cavernosa. The corpora cavernosa, because they receive most of the blood, they're responsible mainly for making the penis rigid during an erection so that uh, intercourse can take place. The corpus spongiosum, even though it contains blood vessels, it's only receiving about 10% of the blood. And what its function is to do is to prevent compression of the urethra during erection. And you might ask, why would you want to avoid compression of the urethra? Why would you want to keep the urethra open? Well, assuming that intercourse is taking place, you want ejaculation to occur. And in order for ejaculation to occur, of which we've already talked about that pathway, you have to be able to get the, the semen through the penis and eventually out the external urethral orifice. And so why would you want to avoid this compression of the urethra? Why would you want to keep the urethra open? Well, assuming intercourse is taking place, uh, you want the semen to be able to exit through the external urethral orifice. We've already talked about the pathway of sperm cells and, and then the semen, but that semen's going to have to egg, move through the spongy urethra and then eventually exit the penis. And if it's compressed, the semen can't move through, and so if your goal is pregnancy, fertilization cannot occur because nothing can exit through here if this is compressed. So the corpus spongiosum mainly functions to prevent that compression of the urethra so that the semen can actually exit through. And that process is aided in part by some of the urogenital diaphragm muscles, which we're going to discuss in the next video. Okay. The last thing I want to do in this video is actually dispel a misconception um, about something that the common term for it is pre-cum. Um, of course, the scientific term is going to be pre-ejaculate. But before ejaculation occurs, oftentimes during erection, there will be a secretion coming out of the penis during erection. And a lot of people assume that to be semen. It is actually not semen, and it does not contain sperm cells. Okay? Um, it's actually a secretion from the bulbourethral glands. And remember, those are glands, uh, they're actually right here. Okay, there's actually one on each side near the membranous urethra. They secrete a clear fluid that has a lot of mucus or mucoproteins in it. And remember that it, it has a slightly alkalinity to it. And it helps lubricate the urethra and also neutralize um, leftover acidic urine. Remember, sperm cells don't particularly like acidity. And so if you have leftover urine in the urethra, uh, whenever the sperm moves through that, 
uh, it can actually kill a lot of them. And so you want to maximize the number of viable sperm entering the female. And so the goal of the bulbourethral glands is to get that secretion in there prior to ejaculation and help neutralize that acidity that's present from prior urine. Okay? Um, these secretions do not contain sperm. And they can't contain sperm because ejaculation hasn't occurred yet. So these uh, bulbourethral glands just empty their secretions right into here and it just lubricates the entire lumen of the urethra, that is the spongy urethra. Okay? Um, so it does not contain sperm. And so when somebody says that you can actually get pregnant off of pre-ejaculate, um, it's actually only because of residual sperm cells that might actually be in the urethra. If there are no sperm cells in the urethra, it is impossible to get pregnant um, from that pre-ejaculate. It is impossible because that pre-ejaculate is just that. It is pre-ejaculate. In order to get pregnant, you have to have the ejaculation, that is, uh, sperm cells moving from the epididymis and all that good stuff. Okay? Um, so if someone did happen to get pregnant off of pre-ejaculate, that is only due to residual sperm cells that might have been left in that area. Okay? Um, so just understand that, that it is possible, it's not super common, but it has nothing to do with the bulbourethral glands themselves. They do not secrete sperm cells. Okay, so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of this part of the male reproductive anatomy. Like I said in the next video, we're going to be looking at the urogenital diaphragm, then we're going to look at spermatogenesis, and then maybe do a few more videos, and then we're going to move on to the female reproductive system, which arguably is a lot more complex than the male version. All right, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.